Hi everyone, um, my name is Neil Welch. I'm head of SSC's lab services here at the Sports Surgery Clinic in Santry. Uh, I'd, I'd like to take a, a minute just to say thanks um, to everyone who's uh, watching today uh, for taking time out of your, your day to, uh, to, to listen. Hopefully you'll find the, uh, the talk interesting um, and uh, you'll find it helpful to, to help you get it back into, uh, into tennis. Um, I, I'm gonna focus a little bit on today uh, back pain. Um, because it is uh, the most common uh, musculoskeletal condition that we deal with. Um, and, and very often it can be very debilitating and, and stop you from, from doing many of the activities that you, that you want to do. Um, in this instance, obviously, uh, tennis. So we're going to talk about how we can stop your back from stopping your tennis. Now, if you do experience low back pain, I suspect there's a, a good few of you who are tuning in um, who um, are dealing with it. Um, I've no doubt that you've tried lots of things to try and help yourself get better. And that's really common. You know, we, um, we have a problem that we try and solve. We're, we're feeling uncomfortable and we're feeling sore uh, and we reach out for some, uh, some methods to try and assist. So we might take um, action by using something like a, a back support to try and um, reduce the load on the back. And that's a, that's a common approach. It would also be very common to, um, uh, to make other lifestyle adjustments. So I've had people email me um, uh, lists of mattresses and, um, and for advice on, on what mattress to pick up. And um, I wouldn't be the world's foremost expert on mattresses and, and neither do I think that's just gonna be the, uh, the way to, to solve low back pain either. And um, similarly, um, I've had lists of chairs sent to me. And now if anybody has managed to swing one of these for their, uh, for their office at home, uh, fair play. Um, but again, I'd, I'd be of the mind that um, uh, some of these external solutions, the, the supports, the mattresses, the chairs might not be the best approach for improving your back. Similarly, we look for um, remedies as well. So whether we, we try dry needling, needling or acupuncture um, or something a little bit more extreme. Um, and, and the use of uh, cupping seems to be a little bit more, um, uh, more common these days. Um, and I guess with, with all these approaches, uh, they kind of make sense in one way because we're, we're looking for ways to, um, uh, to improve our situation. Uh, and very often we look for ways that are external to us. So we're looking for the, for the magic pill or the, the silver bullet to make us better. Sometimes we, um, we go in the way of exercise, but frequently when, when we look at the, um, the exercise solutions that are offered up, um, and these images are actually from a, a research study looking at the um, impact of exercise and low back pain. Um, I, I guess two things kind of stand out. One is um, the, the research evidence around exercise is mixed. And when you look at the type of exercises that are being, um, that are being used, uh, I guess you might see uh, a reason why. Um, I'm a strength and conditioning coach by, uh, by trade. So when I look at these images uh, and I look at the, um, the exercises and maybe what they're trying to achieve, the only thing I can sort of see from this intervention is that this person, if they do this for a period of time, is gonna get better at balancing on a red ball. So what I wanna to do today is talk you through maybe some of the factors that um, uh, might be a little bit more effective for helping you manage your back and keeping you on court. So when we talk about low back pain, broadly speaking, um, we're not talking about the spine itself. Now, I'm sure lots of you have had scans of your back and they've shown disc bulges or uh, changes in, in facet joints, but these are very common um, uh, elements or findings on, a, on an MRI scan that people without low back pain have. More often than not, um, what we're talking about is muscular issues. So when we, we find we're a little bit sore kind of either side of the back, um, we might be thinking that there's an issue with our lumbar extensors. Now these guys are active in lumbar extension. So when you arch your back, those muscles are working. They also play a role in stabilizing the back, but you can see where the, at the very bottom of the orange um, and, and yellow images, they're your, your lumbar extensors, where they attach to the pelvis. So they can be active in trying to control the movements of the pelvis and, and extend the hip. Um, so once we start to understand the role of the muscles, we can maybe start to figure out why they might be doing a little bit too much work for us. Um, some of us might be finding that when we, we get a sore back, it's a little bit more out towards the side. Um, so what we would call our lateral quadrants. And one of the muscles out there that contributes is what we call our quadratus lumborum. Now, again, this is a lumbar extensor. So again, um, it helps you to arch your back. And again, if, if you utilize uh, those strategies quite frequently, uh, that might be a reason why those muscles are, are taking on more work. 
They're also responsible for assisting in lumbar lateral flexion, so that's bending over to the side. Uh, and that what they also do is, is help control the pelvis, so they help um, uh, provide stability when we're on one leg. So broadly speaking, when we're thinking about low back pain, um, we're trying to understand why some of these um, muscles might be doing a little bit more work than we want them to. And what we also need to do in, in, um, in context as well is try and understand the role they might be playing while you're playing tennis. Okay, because ultimately that's what we're discussing today is, is how to keep you guys on court without your back from, from stopping you from doing that. Now, when we consider the, the musculature in, in the back, um, there's, there's a few areas that we're, we're looking to try and consider. So um, I'm sure people have heard um, and been told, I'm sure in the past, um, that the hip flexors might be a little bit weak or a little bit tight. Um, this is one of your hip flex, flexors, your psoas muscle. Um, it's attaching to the, uh, to the front of your spine um, and crosses the hip. Now, in this instance, the reason I'm showing this is to give you some idea of what a well-conditioned psoas muscle looks like. Okay, so the, the dark gray image there is muscle. Um, any of the, the white bits you can see kind of, and you can see towards the, the bottom of the green box, um, a, a whisper of uh, white marble, and that's fat. These are your lumbar, um, lumbar extensors. So again, same sort of thing, give you some idea of what a well-conditioned set of lumbar extensors looks like. Uh, a little bit of marbling in there, indicating some, um, some fat infiltration within the muscle, but only a small amount. Like looking at this on a scan, you, you, you're looking at a very well-conditioned um, set of lumbar extensors and hip flexors. I just to give you some context, what, what happens when we're a little bit deconditioned, um, or a lot deconditioned in, th in this instance, um, so again, we think about that psoas muscle, we think about the size and strength of that. Um, so we, we, we quite, we're likely going to be weak here in our hip flexors. But then we can see the, um, the degree of fatty infiltration within the lumbar extensors. So a lot more towards the rump stake end of the spectrum rather than the fillet stake. Uh, and we can start to understand then maybe why um, some of the muscles in the back might not be coping with some of the work we're asking it to do, particularly if this is the, the, the condition they're in. So we were looking to try and increase the strength of our back and there are certain exercises that we can do. So I'm going to talk you through a, a deadlift now, which would be one of the ones that we would use in order to be able to increase the strength, I guess, of the muscles up the back of the body as a whole. Um, but we've uh, some research published that shows the increase in size and the reduction of fat within the muscles in the back from doing this. So this would be um, a deadlift movement. We're going to show you it in a rack. So once we're back in gyms, hopefully you'll be able to do this. But if you have dumbbells at home, you'll be able to pick these up off the floor. The most important points here are at the top of the lift, where Jack is really working on squeezing his bum. And on the way down, most of the movement is from the hips. So he's working very hard on pushing his bum backwards. Um, and if you're doing this right, you'll feel the muscles down the back of the, back of the legs feeling like there's a big stretch on them. So Jack will be feeling a stretch down his hamstrings and in his bum here. Uh, most importantly, really, with this is you shouldn't feel like the back is doing most of the work. We're targeting the hips with this, uh, with, with this exercise and the back is playing an assistance role. So if we again, we think about our lumbar extensors. So I, I said before about um, them being active in lumbar extension. So if you arch the back a lot, they're working quite hard. Um, and the, the key bit as well for me is the last point, hip extension. So if your, hip ex your primary hip extensors aren't doing the work um, uh, as well as they might, then you might be recruiting the lumbar extensors a little bit more. So essentially, if the hips don't do the work, your back has to do a bit more. And our primary hip extensors are glute max. Uh, it's the biggest, strongest muscle in the body. And again, as I said, if, if we're underactive here and not very strong, then we've got to start considering what other structures are going to take that work on. So we were looking to try and increase the strength of our glute max. And this is probably one of the most important exercises that we use regularly here at the sports surgery clinic um, for hamstring issues, for hip issues, for back issues. Um, it's very common to have some weakness in our, in, our, in our glute max. So a single leg hip thrust is a really good option for you. So you'll see here the setup is to have the, the back on the, uh, on the bench. And you'll see Jack here, he's keeping his eyes pointing straight down the gym. He's not throwing his head back and his ribs up. The idea there then is that all of the push and the movement comes from his bum. So you'll see again when we, we go through, he's working very hard with his left glute to push up and squeeze. 
and to lock the hips out using the bum. And that's what you should feel when you're doing this. You should feel like your bum is working really hard. Now again, progression with that is to start adding weight by um, putting a dumbbell on top of the thigh. But if you can manage that with your body weight, then you're doing all right as a starting point. If we start thinking about um, those of us who are dealing with more lateral low back pain, it's very common when you, you can kind of tell when somebody starts rubbing their back and they have the, the, the chicken wing, the elbow out to the side and they're rubbing the, towards the side of their back. Um, this is more the, um, the area that we might be thinking about. So um, it's an active lumbar extensor as well. Uh, so we can't discount the, uh, the two exercises we've just done that, that should help. Um, but they're also important for helping provide stability around the pelvis. So if we look at what else provides stability around the, pe the pelvis. Again, it's one of our glute muscles, our, our glute med. Um, this is going to be an important one for us to, to exercise as well. So how we might get after this is um, through a, a, a relatively basic climb exercise, but there's a couple of important points here. So keeping the heels together, slowly dragging the knees apart, and just making sure we're not rolling backwards away from the floor. Okay, so if Niall here was rolling back and starting to point his hips up towards the ceiling, then his bum isn't gonna do as much work as, uh, as we'd like it to. So he wants to keep his right hip rolling forward and his hand will provide stability there. Slowly pull the band apart. And if you're doing this right, you'll feel a really strong burn sensation going on in the side of the bum cheek. Okay, and that would be our glute me taking on some work for us. Now with all of these exercises, you should feel like you've had some improvements immediately after doing them. So the back should feel a little bit lighter and a little bit looser. Now, obviously in tennis, there's a lot of rotation involved. Um, and sometimes we can use our, um, our muscles in our back a little bit more um, when our abdominals aren't doing enough work. Okay, so this is where um, some of our rotational exercise, in order to be able to target some of the, uh, the muscles around the, um, uh, the front of the body and get them doing a little bit more work for us. So a half kneeling paloff press is a good option here. All you need is a band at home. So some tension on the band, we're on one knee and then we're slowly pushing the hands out in front of us and we hold and we're just resisting rotation. So the, the hands ideally stay in the midline of the chest all the way through. The bands doesn't get an opportunity to pull us closer to the rack. Okay, by doing that, what you should feel is the muscles around your stomach resisting that movement. So Jack here should feel the, the sides of his stomach working quite hard. Again, just going to, to, to a point where you feel fatigue in, this, in, in the muscles on, um, uh, in the stomach and then switching sides um, should help, again, uh, reduce some of the loading on the back, as well as obviously help our performance when we're playing. Now, one of the important factors, again, when we start more considering overhead work, um, so obviously um, uh, serving is a, is a large component of, um, of what we do when we play tennis. Um, trying to understand the range of motion that we have in the shoulder becomes important. So one of the tests that we do for this is um, our shoulder flexion. So just lying on your back and seeing whether you can get your thumbs over your head to the ground. Now in this second part here, I've just tried to flatten my back. It's a little bit harder, but I've got decent shoulder range of motion, get my thumbs to the floor. If I arch my back, it's a lot easier. But what that's telling me is, it, is that I'm borrowing a lot more range of movement from my back and it's not my shoulders necessarily doing the work. So if you find with your back flat that you're not able to get your hands to the ground, again, I'll, I'll replay that. So if on this second um, example in the middle here, I've got my back flat against the floor and I can't get my thumbs to the ground, then I'm lacking a bit of shoulder flexion, which means I'm gonna struggle with anything overhead or I'm gonna borrow from my back in order to be able to get my arms overhead. So one of the reasons we get back pain on our overhead movements is because we're lacking shoulder range of motion. Now, if you tried that yourself at home, there are some exercises we can do to help it. So first part, like a relatively basic exercise here, would be taking a bit of TheraBand, keeping some resistance on it, trying to keep the back flat and just trying to work through a, a greater range of motion. So one of the reasons we sometimes lack range of motion around the shoulder is just because we don't train ourselves to get into those positions. So simply by adding some of these exercises to your routine, you find that your shoulder range of motion improves. 
So pushing out against the band and keeping the thumbs pointing backwards will activate the muscles in your rotator cuff. So it'll be a good rotator cuff workout as well as improving your shoulder flexion range of motion. Now, shoulder rotation is, is a very important component within tennis as well. And, and testing your range of motion here is something you can do to find out whether it's an area you need to develop. So just resting your elbow on a cushion, keeping your legs flat, and just seeing whether we can get the hand back towards the ground. Now, the temptation here is to reach with the fingers rather than trying to get the back of the hand slash wrist to the floor. Now, a lot of us will, will struggle in order to, uh, to get the hand all the way down to the ground. In which case, again, we're lacking some rotation range of motion, which very often comes from the muscles controlling the movement rather than the joint itself, which means that it's trainable. So an exercise that we can do, and I'd argue this is something we should be doing um, if we are playing tennis anyway, um, providing stability and control around the shoulder is really important. And our rotator cuff muscles are really important for this, um, is um, some e external rotation work. So again, a very simple exercise, small dumbbell at home. Just have the elbow resting on the knee and then it's a rotation we're looking for. So the elbow should stay at 90 degrees all the way through. And exactly where I'm grabbing my shoulder there is where you want to be feeling it. Sometimes it'll take a bit of work and a bit of playing around with the technique to make sure you're feeling it at the shoulder blade um, rather than say at the front or the top of the shoulder. Or play around with the exercise and as soon as you have it, then a little bit of um, uh, work taking that muscle to fatigue will, will start to condition the rotator cuff. And again, there'll be some of us here who've had to deal with rotator cuff tendinopathies in the past and this type of exercise will be a really important part of your rehab. So again, by starting to implement some of these exercises into your routine, first of all, it should stop you getting injured. And if you do have some soreness, it will, it will likely take care of a, a lot of it. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight into um, some methods that you can um, take on yourselves to, to help with your back, um, to, um, to, to help train some of the muscles around your back so that um, you feel a little bit less discomfort, a little bit less pain and help you get back on court. And the, the shoulder obviously is a really important proponent with playing tennis. Um, test your range of motion out at home. So try those, um, those little tests that we, we put up in the presentation there. Uh, and then what you should find gradually, if you, if, you, if you are consistent at those exercises, is when you go back to retest your shoulders, you should notice some improvements. Um, and if you need any more help at all, feel free to contact us here at the Sports Surgery Clinic and we'll see if we can help. And thanks very much for taking the time out to watch the presentation. Um, and we'll be back on uh, shortly for some, some questions and answers.